here to the uh, 39th anniversary of Earth Day, the 139th anniversary of the birth of Lenin, uh, not an environmentalist, um, and according to Gaylord Nelson, the 828th birthday of St. Francis of Assisi, uh, possibly the first uh, environmentalist. Uh, Earth, Day, Earth Day in uh, 1970, I, I think m many of us uh, would kind of mark as the beginning of the modern uh, environmental uh, movement. And of course it started uh, basically as a college, college teach-in. Uh, and so I think it's quite appropriate that we here uh, for the second year in a row uh, with the Energy Initiative are trying to, uh, celebrating Earth Day with a very distinguished uh, speaker, uh, Jim McCarthy. Uh, Jim is the just past president and current uh, chairman of the American Association for the Advancement of Science. Uh, he's the Agassiz Professor of Biological Oceanography at, at Harvard. Uh, uh, you can read on the poster uh, lots and lots of what uh, uh, Jim has done. He, he heads the Environmental Science and Public Policy Program uh, at Harvard, uh, research uh, in biogeochemical cycles and, and climate. Uh, among other things, he was co-chair of the IPCC Working Group 2, uh, which for the 2001 assessment uh, uh, had responsibility for assessing uh, impacts of and vul vulnerabilities uh, to global climate uh, uh, change. Uh, many awards, uh, but uh, most important, uh, a very avid and accomplished fly fisherman, uh, <laughs> which is something that we, uh, we will have to do. Um, this, is a, this is a time where we all see tremendous change uh, with our new administration, uh, really unprecedented attention uh, um, uh, being given uh, to clean energy, uh, to its role in addressing uh, climate risk mitigation. Uh, last week here, some of you may have uh, been at, a, at, at our uh, symposium with uh, Congressman Markey, Carol Browner, John Holdren, uh, members of Congress and administration, setting the stage for a very interesting year uh, uh, here in our Congress, but also uh, on the road to Copenhagen, the Copenhagen meeting, uh, although perhaps the Copenhagen round uh, may be, uh, may be what, uh, what we are looking for. And so today, Jim uh, is going to talk, I think, looking back at some of the science, uh, underpinning our understanding of climate, and then looking forward to what lies ahead uh, and what can lie ahead. Jim? Thank you, Ernie. Ernie invited me to uh, lunch a week ago Monday, and I actually thought it was a free lunch, but uh, <laughs> as I was leaving, he said, what are you doing next Wednesday? So here I am. And uh, thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. And as I look around, uh, there are people in the audience who could give this talk as well as I, but thank you for the opportunity. Um, this photo is, of course, um, of the fragile um, northern end of our planet, which I will say a little more about later. Um, the occasion, um, April 22nd, Earth Day, um, as Ernie said, uh, really a very interesting origin, originally a teach-in. George Gaylord Nelson had been shocked by what he had seen a year earlier with the, uh, the Union oil blowout off the coast of Santa Barbara. It was a time when um, those of us who were living near urban centers realized that uh, the air uh, was no longer something that you could avoid and assume would just take care of itself. Um, I have uh, read of the condition of the Charles River at that time, and in contrast to its condition today, the lower Charles River, uh, it's a startling improvement. It was um, before the Environmental Protection Agency. Uh, President Nixon later in that year, 1969, presented, or 1970, presented to, um, uh, to the U.S. Congress his proposal for an Environmental Protection Agency. He thought it should be in spring. He thought it Earth Day, George, uh, Senator Nelson thought Earth Day should be uh, kind of after midterms, before finals. Um, he thought, you know, when the weather turns nice, he didn't quite anticipate the weather today. He also thought um, uh, middle of the week, so it doesn't conflict with students' interest in the weekend. So the first one was actually on Wednesday, uh, like, like this year. So uh, much has been, uh, of course, written about um, <coughs> our ability to actually uh, see the Earth right at that time. Uh, many of you uh, my age will certainly recall uh, the summer before the first Earth Day when 
when um, Neil Armstrong set foot in the moon and we were still reeling from those, uh, those images of the, of the Earth from space and, and the realization that uh, this, uh, this really is a, uh, an extraordinarily uh, fragile, uh, fragile planet. Now, in, um, in 1970, at the time of the first Earth Day, uh, nobody was talking very regularly about concerns relating to the heating of the planet. This is uh, from the, the 2001 IPCC report. And if you, uh, if you look at the 1970 point here, in fact, no one had even put together a graphic like this with the globally average temperatures. But, but generally, it's known there had been a warmer period in the, in the uh, 30s and 40s, and that uh, in the 50s, 60s, and into the 70s, uh, it was considered to be a, a time that, that Earth's temperature had not, uh, not changed much. And it, it was also in this time that people put together the first reconstructions of the, uh, of the uh, Earth's temperature at the time of the last glacial maximum 18,000 years ago and began to realize as they looked at the long-term cycles that we were at about a point when you would expect that uh, the Earth's climate would begin cooling and, and over the next 100,000 years uh, without any, anything else occurring take us back to another cold period. Uh, if you look at uh, what were really important concerns, in addition to what was happening in our coastal waters and, and, uh, and our urban areas, water quality, rivers, uh, oceans, uh, air quality, uh, there was enormous focus on what was happening to population. And so in, um, in 1970, there were about 3.7 billion people. Today, of course, we're at something like 6.7. And notice in this graphic, um, from 1804 to 1922, uh, the addition of a billion, 118 years, then 37 years for the next one, 15 for the next, and there was a, a real concern. And as you read uh, from that era, Paul Ehrlich's population bomb, that this number going from 118 to 37 to 15 uh, uh, projected 13, 12, and that this number would continue to, uh, to be smaller forward in time and there was a point at which, um, as Ehrlich's writings uh, suggested, uh, something would explode. Uh, but of course, um, we know that, that um, th this is from a, a recent report, a 2002 report um, from the US Census Bureau. Um, we know that this number now is, has reached a nadir and, and is, is once again uh, increasing. So what was uh, a sense of real urgency at that point has relaxed somewhat. And, and here are growth rates. These always lag a bit in time. Uh, the growth rate of, of global, uh, global uh, population growth seeing uh, from the 50s into the, into the 70s at something like uh, uh, one and a half to 2% a year and then beginning a decline and then scenarios uh, heading into the future. I'll say a little more about these later showing that by the time you get to 2050, uh, the growth rate would decline, in this one case, actually go negative. Uh, if you take the medium case, you see that it's, it's getting preciously close to zero. So th this has strongly affected uh, the, the projections of demographics. And if we look now at what the IPCC used in, in 2001 for its climate scenario projections, which I'll say more about later, uh, you'll see that they used a range of scenarios, 2050 showing a world population that was uh, something in the order of, of, uh, of 9 or, or 10 billion at the low level and up to something that uh, is maybe 11 to 12 at the high level. Um, but, but in fact, um, the two of the scenarios worked with this, with, this, with this particular, two of the climate scenarios with this particular population scenario showing that the human population would peak mid-century with this scenario uh, would begin to, to slow and not, not quite peak by 2100, this one, of course, rising uh, more uh, rapidly. But of course, um, as, as population was, was increasing over this period, um, something else was increasing even faster. So from 1850 to 2000, uh, population grew fourfold, but uh, the world's energy supply uh, grew by 20-fold. And so this, uh, this graphic takes us to 2000, but we see, of course, uh, over this period, uh, biomass from 1850 maybe doubling. We see uh, n uh, uh, hydro uh, becoming a discernible wedge in the, in the last half of this past century, but still a small number by the end. 
uh, nuclear, again, the last half of this last century, and uh, maybe three times hydro in this graphic, or maybe roughly a third or half of biomass. And then, of course, the big wedge in the last half century is, is coal growing some, oil growing enormously, and, uh, and gas at sort of an intermediate rate. So uh, the point being that while people increased in number and our standard of living increased, we were fueling that with uh, an increasing reliance on oil and gas and thus um, energy sources that emit carbon dioxide. So if we look now, um, jumping ahead, but I'll come back to this later, at the IPCC scenarios for CO2 emissions, um, this is from the 2001 uh, third assessment. Uh, you, see, um, you see scenarios, uh, a red one broken into a solid red, a dashed, and dotted. I'll explain that in a moment. Uh, a yellow, green, and a blue, and then a, a reference scenario from um, uh, the IS-92A. And if you, um, if you look at um, just the red one for a moment, um, here's the dotted, here's the solid, here's the dashed. Um, what's common? Why, is it, why are they all red? They're all red because they're the same demographic scenario. They are the same uh, development scenario for the developing and the developed world. There's only one thing that differs. The dotted one uses fossil fuels like we are today. The solid one with substantial reductions. The dashed one with dramatic reductions in our dependence on fossil fuel. So again, this shows the power of that one factor. Obviously, we're looking at CO2 emissions, at CO2 sources, that, that a, a large uncertainty, and as you go forward with any of the projections for IPCC climate models, is what choices humans will make about how we fuel our economy. So, um, of course, we, um, we can see the evidence of uh, some of this activity uh, extraordinarily displayed at night. Uh, I began this talk, um, and Ernie had suggested I could maybe adapt something from my um, presidential address at the uh, February AAAS meeting with the title we had today. I began the talk with the words, Our Planet. Uh, we've used it like it's our planet. And, uh, and certainly uh, the evidence of, of that presence is clear in, in a graphic like this, which shows the nighttime illumination. Uh, there would be some natural uh, light sources here. That is to say, maybe uh, fires started by lightning. And at certain times of year, you could see the, the, the aurora, uh, northern hemisphere or southern hemisphere. But as you look at these intense uh, splashes of light, and not only in land, but if you looked around the island of Japan at night, if you've ever flown over there, the the extraordinary um, sort of um, illuminated footprint of the Japanese fishing fleet, uh, again, shows how we um, uh, extend sort of our presence uh, on the surface of the land and the water uh, into the atmosphere, reaching uh, well out into space uh, through the illumination that, again, a tune of 80% on average is fueled by, by fossil fuel. So uh, this ability to, to actually uh, see the Earth from space has, of course, um, also enabled us to begin to study uh, not only how the Earth system is configured, but how it's changing and, in some cases, test uh, our ideas as to how it's changing in response to anthropogenic activities. And the, the extraordinary power of the sensing systems that allow us to see in this case, um, where the photosynthetic material is, uh, both in the ocean, uh, with a, a band of, of green representing a higher concentration or activity than the, than the blue, uh, red being the, the most intense uh, uh, concentration of, of chlorophyll, the photosynthetic pigment in the oceans. You see the large uh, central ocean gyres. Of course, this is a flat projection. It's very, very distorted. Uh, we see the northern hemisphere uh, showing a signal like the southern hemisphere, and this is this is averaged um, over a, a complete annual cycle. So, whereas part of the year there'd be very little illumination here and very little here, on average you can see that the biological activity in the ocean um, uh, stands out in the high latitude regions, a little band along the equator, certain coastal areas from upwelling processes, and of course on land you can see the the areas that are uh, too arid to support. Um, 
extensive vegetation. You see the heavily vegetated areas. And you can uh, today uh, follow very, very uh, high resolution changes in the loss of forest cover in Asia and Africa. And, and, and we, um, we know as you uh, look at projections like the Millennium Assessment that many of these land use changes uh, will continue again with different development scenarios. So if we look at pasture and cropland, we see the area of that having, having grown um, over, over time in the, in the developing regions, actually declining somewhat in the industrial regions from 1970, uh, our first Earth Day to today. If we look at forests, we see forests declining uh, rather dramatically in the developing world and, and actually recently showing globally average a slight uh, uh, regrowth in, in uh, the, the industrialized or developed nations. And with the scenarios used by the Millennium Assessment, again, uh, largely depend based on choices people will make, you see that there are multiple futures. Again, um, the, the last word in the title of this talk uh, to emphasize the fact that um, there isn't one future, there are multiple futures, and, and which of those uh, plays out will depend upon choices we make. And you can begin to see now uh, how land use changes and um, which result in, in, uh, in habitat loss, uh, think of the destruction of forests, um, or the, uh, the development of, of, um, of uh, the, the urbanization of, of land areas uh, versus climate change affect the, um, the species composition, the biodiversity in different regions uh, differently. And so we see, for example, uh, climate change, uh, if we look globally, um, having a, a smaller effect on biodiversity relative to, to habitat loss, and these are with different scenarios, again, from um, the Millennium Assessment. But if we, look at, uh, if we look at the Arctic, we see this is the area where climate change stands out as a stronger factor relative to tropical forests or temperate forests. Here again, human activity being uh, the, greatest, um, the greatest driver of this change. Um, one could not uh, be a biologist and talk this year without uh, mentioning uh, Charles Darwin. Um, it's the, the 150th anniversary of the publication of The Origin of Species. It's the 200th anniversary of Charles Darwin's birth. And many of us look upon The Origin of the Species as having been the first volume that really put the, the life on Earth in the context of its environment. So in many regards, the coevolution of, of life and its life support system uh, trace very profoundly to this volume. But 1859 was also interesting in that it was uh, the year that uh, Sir John Tyndall, an Irish physicist, uh, discovered that carbon dioxide is a radi radiatively active gas. Now, the notion of the Earth having an atmosphere that functioned as a greenhouse uh, dates earlier to Fourier's work. But Sir John Tyndall made the first measurements and actually quantified the degree to which carbon dioxide is, um, is absorbed, um, or excuse me, which infrared um, uh, irradiation is, is absorbed uh, with a, uh, in a vessel that contains carbon dioxide. Um, the, um, the greenhouse effect, of course, is, uh, is well known. Um, it's it's uh, been extensively studied since then, but it's also interesting that if we look at 1859, it was by coincidence the, the first commercial oil well in, um, in Pennsylvania, uh, Edward L. Drake in Titusville, Pennsylvania, it, um, it pumped about 25 barrels a day, and within a few years, uh, this is what that landscape looked like. So it took no time at all to, um, to figure that uh, there was a, a very, uh, very profitable endeavor uh, to um, expose this material, in those cases rather shallow wells, and, um, and burn it. Um, also in 1859, a Parisian by the name of Lenoir is creating a great sensation among his countrymen by the exhibition of a caloric engine. Turns out he developed uh, the first internal combustion engine that used a spark. So previous engines uh, had been invented that had more uh, a combustion more like that of a diesel with a glowing rod. Uh, and this is a uh, Scientific, American, uh, pub, uh, Scientific American issue in 1860 that refers to this. 
gas, although much dearer as fuel than coal, is so cleanly and manageable that it will someday come, come into use for the multitude of small engines. Um, so um, 1859, one more reference. Uh, it's the year that Svante Arrhenius was born. And Svante, Svante Arrhenius was the Swedish chemist who um, we all know from the Arrhenius equation. But um, uh, he, um, he was the first to make back of envelope calculations about the effect that uh, the release of carbon dioxide to the atmosphere with the combustion of coal and gas might actually have on the Earth's temperature. And his, uh, his calculations, his back of envelope calculations were that if we were to double uh, the, the natural carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, it would, it would increase Earth's temperature by an average of about 5 or 6 C. And if you compare that with the recent IPCC reports, which say something in the order of 2 to 4 and a half, um, that's a remarkable, um, good, remarkably good guess. He, he thought we wouldn't get there for a thousand years or so, so he was, uh, he was off a bit on, on that mark. But he certainly realized that uh, there was something that we needed to pay attention. And this idea then lay dormant uh, for a while, um, but a few people picked it up and worked with it. And, and um, uh, one was, um, was Callender, who, um, who worked with his idea through the 1930s, and he was firmly convinced that we were well on our way to heating the planet. If you remember that earlier graphic, uh, you can see that he was making these calculations during a period when Earth's temperature was increasing. Um, Callender died in the 1960s, um, uh, probably confused and puzzled as to why, with increasing release of carbon dioxide, the Earth's atmosphere had not continued to warm. What, of course, he was completely unaware of was the masking effect of, of aerosols. But, of course, we know that um, in the 1950s, uh, we had... Um, Just a sec here. There we go. Um, the late Roger Revelle uh, was one of the first people to begin to organize a serious effort to try and understand what was happening to carbon dioxide in Earth's atmosphere. And he argued that uh, our society is performing a great geophysical experiment uh, without a, a control. And of course, um, the history uh, of Roger's contribution is well known. Uh, hiring Charles David Keeling, uh, a, a postdoc from Caltech, who um, began then to make the very first measurements of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. And in his, um, in his honor, um, the the trace of that atmospheric signal of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere we today refer to as the Keeling curve. So they began the work um, here in, in 1957, 1958. Um, many of us who uh, work on time series appreciate the fact that um, there are some gaps that have been filled in, the, in this trace because there were actually periods when they couldn't manage to convince the funding sources to continue this work. Um, they found that, um, that the concentration had an annual cycle, which um, they understood right away to reflect the, the uh, dominance of the terrestrial biosphere in the northern hemisphere with the, the spring rush of photosynthesis extracting CO2 from the atmosphere more rapidly than it was replaced by respiration. And at the end of the first year found the concentration was a little higher than where they began the earlier year. The second year, the same cycle, it was a little higher. Well, you know what happens. The funding agency said, fine, so why do you need to do it again? So there are actually gaps in this trace because they were unable to convince uh, the people uh, who were uh, funding th this work from our federal agencies in, in Washington that it was worth continuing. Um, we see a smooth curve through here that, that uh, sort of takes the seasonality out. And these wrinkles, interestingly, uh, all have uh, important significance. Uh, one can see, uh, for example, a, an El Nino cycle in here. Uh, there, are, uh, there are a number of, of really important um, uh, details that come from this analysis, including uh, the trend over time of the amplitude 
uh, from, the, uh, from the annual cycle actually having increased. Now, we know also something that, that uh, Keeling and Ravel and others had no clue of at that time. In fact, you could go back and look at all of the uh, papers written on carbon in, in Earth's system, in the atmosphere, in land, in the ocean, in, in um, rock, um, deep ocean sediments um, in the late 50s, early 60s, and see if anyone, anyone thought that over the last um, 18,000 years, carbon dioxide could have risen uh, by 100 parts per million in the atmosphere or over a glacial cycle that it might cycle from something like 180 to 280. And, and you won't find anybody having thought that uh, possible or even, even suggested it would be interesting to, to, uh, to think about it. And so when the very first observations in 1986 showed this cycle from today's, you know, this is pre-industrial, at about 280, uh, back to 180, 18,000 years ago, uh, 280, eight, uh, 125,000 years ago, and that was the first cycle. Uh, it was met with uh, initially extraordinary skepticism, but then a realization that this enables one to think about the coupling of biogeochemical cycles and the physical processes of climate that makes sense in a way that um, climate cycles in the past did not. The reinforcing feedbacks of the carbon cycle actually allow for this rapid return of carbon dioxide, or of, of um, the rapid return of carbon dioxide from this feedback allows temperature to rebound as quickly as it does following the, the glacial maximum. We now know, I mean, uh, with ice cores from Greenland and Iceland, that this, uh, Greenland and Antarctica, that this record goes back uh, 800,000 years showing the cycle. And of course, we know that uh, today, uh, the concentration is 380, approaching 390, and, and in, this, uh, in this sort of projection, uh, that slope, of course, uh, is reason for concern. This is the, um, the most recent IPCC report uh, released um, uh, two years ago now, in 2007. And this shows the, um, the global average temperature uh, a different projection from the one I showed earlier, but the same data set uh, showing um, the, the, the data from 1850s forward. Here's that strong warming early in the 1900s. Here's that period we looked at earlier. And then we see this, this rise now that continues um, over the last um, uh, couple of decades in a, in a rather steady upward way. This also shows uh, sea level. Um, increasing over this period and northern hemisphere snow cover. And the width of the, of the, of the blue band here is, um, is the estimate of uncertainties. And you can see over time, for obvious reasons, uh, that the uncertainty, and in this case, the little red tail are the satellite observations in which we have much more confidence than coastal tide gauge stations. So uh, the error on the, the sea level rise measurements reduces significantly. So this is, um, this is a, I think, a really powerful graphic. Um, this shows uh, the ranking of the data from that earlier slide. This is from the World Meteorological Organization. And from the, the warmest to the 50th warmest year, and then this is the entire series going back 150 years. And then colors are binned here, um, uh, 1990 to 2007, uh, 1970, 1989, so the roughly, so, so uh, this one rounds up, but 20-year bins. And so you kind of give it the squint test, go back here and you see solid red, and then some, some uh, uh, high ranking from the earlier 20-year period, and then a red, and then another red, and another red. And you know, you, the more you look at this, the more you can see that um, there are some, some fascinating patterns in this. <coughs> so 1991, um, <coughs> right here, is the uh, 14th warmest year. And then we see 1992, uh, and I can't, let's see, I'll see it better up here. Um, there's 1992 way down here, here's 1993, here's 1994, here's 1996. So 1991 was the year of the eruption of Mount Pinatubo. Um, the largest volcano uh, since El Shisho in 1982. And in 1991, uh, was the first time that due to, due to measurements and satellites orbiting, uh, climate scientists could actually estimate 
the likely effect of the release of aerosol from that volcano on Earth's temperature. And, and climate modeling groups um, made projections based upon their calculations that the next couple of years would in fact be cool relative to the preceding years. And indeed, that's what you see. Uh, 1992, 1991 was the fourth warmest, 1992 was the 29th, 1993 was the 22nd, 1994 was the 19th. Now, we also know that there's, there's modulation that um, occurs as a result of El Ninos in this period. Uh, there was a moderate El Nino in 1994-95, and the year following El Nino of the two-year, 94-95, the second of those two years will be an unusually warm year. So 1995 then jumped to 10th warmest. And the warmest El Nino that we know in that 150-year series was 97-98, and 1998 uh, is the warmest year on record. So if you look at, um, if you look at this pattern, uh, or you look at these data and realize that uh, patterns um, that might look like uh, noise um, can have some, some fairly logical explanations based upon these major forcing features. And, and this is the powerful graphic from the last IPCC report. It's been modified uh, slightly, a little easier to read, I think, in um, the report that is uh, in final stage review now and a member of the author team on this, the, uh, the U.S. Uh, climate change uh, synthesis uh, report. Um, so to the right of this, uh, of this null point are the forcing factors that, that uh, give us warmer conditions. On the left are the forcing factors that give us cooling conditions uh, for, the, uh, for Earth's climate. And, and these are in units of, of watts per square meter. So, so one can actually make the measurements of concentration uh, determine from the, the empirical data what the, uh, the forcing would be, and then sum these. And it is uh, analyses of this sort that have enabled people like, uh, there are several labs that have done this, this happens to be Hansen's, to then reconstruct climate going forward from uh, the late 1800s with um, all of these features. So here's solar variability, um, plus or minus a tenth or so of watt per square meter with the 11-year solar cycle. Um, here is the, the increase in, in the, the, um, the well-mixed greenhouse gases, um, CO2, methane, nitrous oxide, CFCs. Here are the volcanoes. So here's, here's uh, Pinotubo. Here's uh, El Shishon. Here's Krakatoa. Um, so with these forcing factors, uh, one can then rebuild um, with climate models the climate of today. And there, there have been many papers written on this. The, um, they're summarized with this, uh, uh, this simple graphic from the IPCC that shows that um, this is that uh, curve for Earth's temperature, the observations. Here, if you do it only for land and here's for the ocean, that with only the natural forces, that's solar variability, uh, volcanoes, uh, you would project with climate models that the, the Earth's temperature should look like this during this period, the blue band. If you put uh, the natural and anthropogenic forces in, you get the brown band. So, um, what caused the warming in the first third of the last century is the same thing as causing warming now, but what caused it to not warm or actually cool somewhat in the the uh, 50s, 60s, and 70s uh, was the, the aerosol term. And there is some solar variability there as well, but it's stronger the aerosol term. So as we began initially in the, in the 50s in the UK and then, and then in, um, in the 60s in, in, in much of Western Europe, in the, uh, not until the 90s, 60s, 70s, Western Europe, and the 90s in the US, to, uh, to begin removing sulfur from the combustion of coal, initially for human health reasons, then in Europe it had to do with, um, with forests and lakes, and, and in the United States in the 1990s, the first President Bush signed into law the revisions of the, of the Clean Air Act that, that um, had sulfur removed. Uh, the aerosol term is, uh, is thought to be the major uh, dampening force in that period. So you, you can, again, look at a lot of papers that reconstruct this 
And there are some funny little wrinkles. This, uh, this one that uh, stands out here, uh, as you can see, is largely an ocean signal. Uh, there's an interesting recent paper that calls attention to some, some calibration errors as we shifted from the traditional bucket temperature to the injection temperature at about that time. So let me just... Well, the part of what you see is you see, you see the footprint of the, the fingerprint, if you wish, of the aerosols. You can see if you look spatially across the globe, the aerosols are not well mixed globally. They don't have the lifetime of, um, of the well mixed greenhouse gases. So if you, if you tease out that pattern of where the, the aerosols are released, and of course, they're, they're harder to, to, uh, to project we know how much coal and gas and, and oil has been burned. There are really good records on it. It's, it's harder to project the strength of the aerosol term, and then depending upon local weather conditions and the like, it's, it's, it's lifetime in the atmosphere. But, but, but that pattern, teasing that pattern out, first beginning in uh, the mid-90s and then strength in the late 90s is what gave the sort of confidence that, that uh, uh, the attribution question uh, could be supported, that most of the warming in the last 50 years has come from human activities, that it was in part teasing out that, the role of the aerosols. So um, if we look at, at some of the manifestations of a warmer uh, planet, uh, this is the instance of flooding by decade, and each of these bars is a decade. This is again from the millennium assessment, the 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s, and 90s up to 2000. And, and here are the Americas, here's Europe, and, and, and you can see the, the upward jutting, and I, I don't have the criteria for flooding, but the assessment justified its, its, um, its choice of, uh, of, of, of these parameters. Uh, here's the instance of wildfires. Um, again, uh, you see as you move uh, forward in time uh, the, increased, um, uh, the increased frequency. And, and there are a lot of debates as we look at Western United States about um, why we're seeing more fires, but uh, if you look at a place like, um, like Boreal, Alaska, where there is no development, there is no encroachment of uh, human habitation into, into that part of the environment, um, it's pretty clear these are natural and they are not being caused by management, which has uh, you know, led to uh, different land use practices and, and uh, human presence um, close to, the, uh, close to the, uh, the, the forests that are now burning. So um, if we then um, if we look at where we're headed with uh, these uh, climate scenarios, which are based upon the emission scenarios that I referred to earlier, and, and this is from the most recent IPCC report. Um, again, the same scenario uh, drivers were used, more refined climate models. Um, you see uh, compressed here the, the temperature trend over the last 100 years. Uh, to 2000, then moving forward, uh, this one, uh, which would uh, look like uh, dream world at the moment, is one that assumes that, um, that emissions in 2000 are held constant forward in time. Well, we've already passed that time, we know they aren't. Um, uh, these, these are the ones that, that arrive from those different emission scenarios. This red one is not broken into the dashed and dotted versions I showed earlier, or one of these would bend down uh, looking uh, more like uh, this, uh, something lower than this blue line. So a few words about the Arctic. Um, as, we, as we know, um, Earth has not warmed uh, uniformly. Uh, some of that has to do with the aerosol, but some has to do with, with um, the way uh, feedbacks occur in the system. And again, this is a very distorted projection um, because of, uh, I mean, this flat projection, very distorted projection of the, of the area of the Arctic here. But temperature uh, being um, highest here with these uh, dark colors, uh, showing that the northern hemisphere, um, and to be expected from any, any model projection, uh, land area would warm more than ocean area. The northern hemisphere dominated by land. And you see these Arctic temperatures. This is 2001 to 2005, the delta T. And all models going forward uh, show this uh, being amplified, so that the temperature in the, in the Arctic by the end of the century in those earlier scenarios, or a mid-range scenario from those earlier set would be something in the order of six or eight C uh, warmer. Um, so um, 
we, um, we know that um, with a warmer earth, we'll have more sea ice loss, we'll have less snow, we'll have less frozen ground. That is, ground that's now frozen will not freeze as deeply. It will, it will have a stronger uh, summer, summer uh, thaw. Um, and there are projections uh, that by the, the middle of this century, we will have lost sea ice from the summer Arctic condition. Now, um, here uh, is the sea ice area from 1979 forward. Uh, again, they're older data, but these are the satellite data. And the loss of summer sea ice, this is extent, um, was about a percent a year until uh, 2007 when uh, the, the, the area dropped by roughly 20%. Uh, this shows the 2008 value. Nobody knew what um, uh, 2008 would be, uh, so it wasn't uh, really terrible news. It ticks up slightly. However, the ice was thinner, so if you compute ice volume in the Arctic, um, it is, sets a new record in 2008. And I'm going to show you anecdotally a couple of photos. Uh, this is in the early 90s, <coughs> what one would see in the central Arctic within 50 or so miles to the North Pole. <clears throat> this is a Russian nuclear icebreaker. This is the crack being caused by the 75,000 horsepower machine plowing through the ice. The thickness of this ice here is about three or four meters. These little windows up here are a meter high. I was in a small helicopter out in front of this. Here, here is uh, 2004. Uh, notice the thickness of the ice here. And you say, well, were we in the same place? How could this be? Um, here, if you start in, in Franz Josef Land and head towards the North Pole, um, 1985 to 2000, you would have been traveling through a little bit of one-year ice, but then two, three, four, five, six-year ice. The six-year ice is in the order of three or four meters thick. Um, notice now, moving forward to, to 2008, and this is February. So all the water in this area is cold enough to freeze in February, so it will have ice. So here's the one-year ice, and again, if you traveled from Franz Josef Land to the North Pole, you'd see you could stay in one-year ice and maybe barely clip some two-year ice. So this was a year ago. I've been looking. There is, doesn't seem to be a comparable graphic yet available, but um, if, um, if we look at what has recently appeared, this is the March uh, extent of sea ice, and notice that um, the we had a nadir that preceded the summer nadir, and it has rebounded some, again, an area. But um, if we look at uh, this winter condition, this is February, we had an anomalously warm area sitting up here in the, uh, off the, um, uh, the Russian coast and, and off uh, Greenland. And if we look at uh, the recent sea ice data, here is the... Um, uh, the, uh, the end of February sea ice data for 2009. So here's the 81 to 2000 median for second uh, and older ice, second year ice, here's the older ice. Here's what it looked like in uh, 2009. Or, or in this next graphic, I'll just uh, blow this bottom panel. Um, blow this bottom panel up. Um, we see in 2009, we set a new minimum for ice older than two years. Uh, the one to two year ice ticked up slightly. The one year ice uh, dropped slightly. So what this means is that uh, with, with one year ice, which means it's thinner, it's more easily, with any unusually warm summer lost, uh, more easily moved about by winds, that um, the Arctic has a, a, will be much more variable in the summer than it was when it had a lot of four, five, and six year ice. Uh, when you open up that water uh, to exchange with the atmosphere, uh, you lose the reflective ice albedo effect. Uh, incident radiation, rather than being 90% reflected, is 90-95% absorbed by the water. You warm the water. You then have uh, not only exchange of energy, you have um, with the, the ice off the water, you'll have more evaporative loss, so you have the exchange of, of, of moisture between the atmosphere and the ocean. And, and, of course, momentum that uh, winds now uh, will move water in the Arctic and to the degree that ice is broken up, move ice in ways it was unable to do before. So uh, this is a huge question as to how this will affect climate, not only in the Arctic basin, but also exchange in the North Atlantic. 
The Arctic Ocean is really a cul-de-sac of the North Atlantic. There's relative little exchange over the, with the Pacific over the broad uh, shelf of the Bering Sea. But uh, we know that there will be dramatic changes for the lives of many of the people who uh, live in the Arctic today with subsistence livelihood. Um, this is a small village in Greenland of about 60 people. Um, they, um, they have um, a, a almost complete subsistence livelihood, historically uh, fishing and, and sealing for about four months a year. Uh, dogs that they use for transport to get them and their gear out on the ice and to bring uh, the, the provisions back. And of course they feed the dogs with the masonry with skeletal remains of fish. So historically they, they were able to, to hunt and fish for four months a year and now it's two. And what happens in the future? Um, one, I mean there's a point at which it is no longer, um, no longer practical. We know that uh, villages like the village of Shishmaref, which I visited two summers ago, um, will have to evacuate. Uh, a group of 600 people, their ancestors have lived in that location for 400 years in the Chukchi Sea and the Alaskan coast. They have no choice but to evacuate. Sea ice is out earlier, uh, heavy winds eroding their barrier island to the point where uh, it is literally dissolving into the sea. So with the Arctic, uh, we're seeing increasingly papers with titles like this. Um, have we reached a tipping point? Um, Arctic system on trajectory to new seasonally ice-free state. And increasingly, we're seeing papers that, um, that call attention to the fact that ecosystems are being um, reconfigured in the Arctic as a result of these changes in ice. So as we um, come back to look at uh, this sort of distribution, realizing that not only uh, will the Arctic be affected, but certainly areas adjacent to the Arctic will be affected by um, the warming of, of um, in this case, um, the Northeast uh, states. This was a study done and completed uh, two years ago um, by about 60 scientists in this area working with the Union of Concerned Scientists uh, from Pennsylvania uh, North in the, in the Northeast states and modeling uh, with an upper and lower range scenario, what uh, the, the uh, climate conditions would be like in New England as we move forward to 2100. Um, and one of the things that will come, and you'll see this when the, the new U.S. synthesis report is out, because we did this sort of thing for all regions of the U.S., comparing an upper and, and lower, not extremes, but um, emission scenarios. In other words, I'd say a higher and a lower rather than, a, than the extreme. And um, there is a period, of course, in which very little we would do today would affect the temperature. But as you move beyond um, the next three or four decades, then you can see the effect of actions taken today. And this simply reflects the inertia in the system. But let me show you the difference that makes if we look at the climate in Massachusetts. Um, if we follow that Hupper scenario by the end of this, this century, 2070 uh, to 2099, the the heat index in Massachusetts would be rather like uh, what one sees today in South Carolina. In the lower of those two emission scenarios, it will be something more like Maryland. And if you want to think about what that does to summer um, hot days, here's Boston. Uh, climatologically, over the last uh, sort of a 30-year period for climatology, uh, one day over 100 degrees. And that lower emission scenario moving forward, um, it would be six by the end of the century, a week, or the upper mission scenario, nearly a month. If we look at days over 90, climatologically it's about 10, move out to the end of the century, it's a difference between uh, something in the order of, of a month or something in the order of nearly two months. So as this new report that will be coming out um, soon, um, the final sign-off was uh, last Thursday, uh, will suggest that if you look across the United States, you see this pattern that choices we make today will very much influence the climate for the latter half of this, this century. And, and a difference uh, of this sort is, uh, is, is in fact uh, common in these uh, studies. Uh, there was a, a paper that recently attracted a lot of attention. Uh, you put irreversible and climate change in a title and and it's sure to gather a lot of news. This is uh, the senior author, and this is Susan Solomon, who 
uh, led working group one in the last IPCC assessment. And it's important to, um, uh, to look at the caveat on her irreversible term in which she says that uh, irreversible impacts uh, that should be expected if atmospheric carbon dioxide concentration increases from current levels near 385 parts per million by volume to a peak of 45600 over the coming century are irreversible dry season rainfall reduction in several regions compared to those in the dust compa compa comparable to those of the Dust Bowl era and inexorable sea level rise. So um, this is this is um, this is a, a, a I think a very very important uh, statement for us to ponder and the realization that if we in fact go along this path uh, to reach something that approaches uh, 600 parts per million it will be a very different climate um, for uh, the rest of, uh, of time. Um, now, a sobering comment is that we haven't done terribly well as we have um, looked at the success of, of any of our uh, forecasts. People sometimes look at the IPCC as some uh, radical group that is prone to overstate things. I can tell you that from firsthand experience, it's the opposite, that uh, this this process um, uh, sort of trims the tails off, off the distribution. And in fact, repeatedly now, it's, it's, it's evident that, that uh, projections made in, in 2000 are proving to be conservative. So here are the projections for fossil fuel emissions. Here are the data. Here are projections from the, the colored scenarios. And notice where the data are. This takes us up through 2007. Um, we are, in fact, riding on the upper range of these. Another place this can be seen is if you uh, is when you look at uh, sea level projections. These are from 1990. The uh, the red uh, lines are the tide gate observations. Notice the noise in these. The satellite is this thin blue trace that's largely masked by the blue line here. That's the precision of satellite estimates. So here was the here was the range of scenario projections. And you can see that sea level rise is, is uh, soaring with observations since 1990 uh, on the upper end of this range. And I can't mention sea level rise without referring to Greenland, of course, as we know the juggernaut in all of this. Um, the IPCC estimates for sea level rise that were released uh, two years ago um, <coughs> were conservative because they did not increase in, in, in include ice loss from Greenland. And, and from uh, recent modeling studies published just this last autumn, uh, the suggestion is that um, including a loss of ice from Greenland by the end of this century uh, with a business as usual scenario, uh, we could be somewhere uh, close to a meter to nearly two meters of uh, sea level rise. So um, we, of course, have a number of um, uh, projections from scenarios for uh, stabilization, which allow you to see uh, with different uh, carbon dioxide concentrations, what the approximate temperatures would be. Um, and, and it is from these stabilization scenarios that uh, we uh, find today um, the sort of, um, of projections that are being made. Um, let's see. I think in the interest, uh, well, let's see. Um, this, uh, this analysis of, um, of uh, um, Steve Pacala and Rob Sokolo has, of course, received a great deal of attention, I think rightly so, as it has suggested that uh, if we look at the bite-sized pieces of, of carbon emissions, uh, if, we, if they were to move as a, in a business-as-usual scenario in this manner, what could be done to bring them down? And, of course, there's no place working on this uh, as broadly and as effectively as your energy center here. I needn't tell you any more about that. But I think um, uh, one, of the, um, one of the interesting observations for me has been uh, what's happened in the political arena over the last handful of years. So th these are the uh, various pieces of legislation that were sitting before the 110th Congress um, uh, for um, the, the release of, of, uh, of U.S. Uh, emissions. Here's history. Here's where we'd be if we run the Kyoto Protocol. Um, if the United States had, had ratified it and if we decided to proceed with it. Uh, 
notice the handful of legislation that all uh, converge in this point here. And you see there the McCain-Lieberman, which became Warner-Lieberman. You have Sanders, Boxer, Waxman, and so on. And this blue band, this is the band that would come from the, the stabilization scenarios uh, suggesting what you would need to do to reduce fossil fuel emissions by 80% by, by 2050 uh, to uh, avoid a warming, a, an incremental warming of 2 uh, degrees C from pre-industrial. And if you had uh, told me in 2004 that you could see the future, you could see 2008 and you could see a presidential campaign, you could see primaries, you could see contestants talking about this issue. Well, there wasn't much talk about it in 2004. Uh, in, 2000, um, in, in 2000, the two candidates actually uh, had a surprising agreement on this. Mr. Bush said if he elected, he would regulate CO2 emissions. He uh, was inaugurated in January and March of, of 2001. He said he changed his mind. But um, in 2004, again, hardly any mention. If you told me that by 2008, every serious candidate, I'd say minus one, uh, was saying we need to get our nation on an agenda that reduces CO2 emissions by 60, 70, 80, or 90 percent. That was kind of the range among the candidates. I would have said, I don't believe it. How, how could we do that in four years? If Mr. Kerry had said that, he would have been, um, I think, locked up as a menace to society. Um, what happened, of course, is that um, you have uh, approaching 1,000 mayors, um, a dozen governors, having already said this. And uh, why have they done that? Well, I think it's because they realize that there's enormous traction um, at the levels in which their constituents are expressing concern. And one of the uh, pieces of information I think that has played powerfully into this is the, is the work done by uh, McKenzie and others, which have shown that, that um, the, the actual costs of, of much of what could be done if wanted to move aggressively um, are negative, and then to see the play out and what, and with various, at today's cost, and we know that with aggressive research, some of those are um, likely to come down. And of course, as we all know, the price of oil is a huge factor in this uh, discussion going forward. I'd like to just make a couple of other comments about how we might imagine working together on this subject. Um, the path to Copenhagen um, is going to be incredibly rocky. Um, if we look at, um, this, is, uh, this is actually, um, this McKenzie study uh, is, is probably out of date. I think a lot of analyses would show now that China has, has, uh, has surpassed the United States as the largest uh, single uh, national emitter of CO2. But, um, but we noticed that there are um, you know, a, a handful of major players in this, and this next graphic uh, will show that if you uh, looked at, um, not the accumulated, but the 2004 portion, it'd have to be adjusted a bit for today. Uh, if you've, um, oh, I'm sorry, let's see. Yeah, okay, so here we go. Um, here's the US, here's China, here's Russia, uh, here's, here's India, here's Japan, Europe, except for Russia, the rest of the world. So if you get this relatively small number of nations together, you've, you've got uh, order 75 or 80 percent of the problem. And I uh, take enormous heart in this document that, that um, was actually prepared for the Lockerbie G8 meeting in 2005. Uh, tragically, uh, that meeting was, was interrupted by the terrorist bombing and the subways in London. But um, at this meeting, a call for world leaders uh, to acknowledge the threat of climate change clear and increasing, to launch an international study to explore scientifically informed targets for atmospheric greenhouse gases, concentrations, their associated emission scenarios, enable nations to avoid impacts deemed unacceptable, um, to identify cost-effective steps. I'm not going to read all this, but you can see this is a, a, a strong statement of working together. And look at the signatories. They are the they are the uh, presidents of the academies of the G8 nations plus India, China, and Brazil. And if you wanted to think about a little more Southern Hemisphere presence, if you were to add Australia, um, uh, with the political changes there, I wouldn't be surprised if they would, uh, their academy and their leaders would agree to something like this. You could add South Africa. 
uh, with you know, 13, 11 nations working together on the emissions side um, with partnerships, um, uh, bilaterals, I think there is far more potential in dealing with the emissions side than there is um, working through uh, the laborious um, uh, Copenhagen process. And uh, I, you know, I, I sincerely hope that Mr. Obama has this in mind. I, we know that some of his advisors, um, who in my estimation couldn't be better chosen for this process, are thinking about these sorts of things. I think it's, um, it's fair to say that um, at a moment like this uh, where we need extraordinary leadership, uh, we indeed have extraordinary leadership, not only in the person who is um, president of the country at this time, but in the team he's assembled, including uh, Holdren and Chu and Rubchenko and Barmas and, uh, and Lander across the whole spectrum of sciences. So I'm, I'm really um, incredibly optimistic and think that if we could get a bit of, of relaxation on the Copenhagen uh, timetable, if we could stretch the Copenhagen process and begin to work aggressively uh, with, with a smaller number of nations on the mitigation side, then you need that cast of all characters to look seriously at the impact questions and to think about what must be started, not think about, begin planning immediately for adaptive measures. So I think a, a two-stage process that would allow us to avoid some of the unfortunate um, rancor that so uh, polarized people uh, in Kyoto would be helpful. I, I reflected on some of this and, and actually in the context of, uh, of the life of an earlier um, president who faced enormous, um, an enormous uh, problem, that of, of uh, the, uh, the Civil War, Mr. Lincoln, and how he kept his eye on the agriculture problem during his administration. He knew that uh, our nation was not up to its potential with regard to agricultural productivity. He realized we didn't understand soils. He, he uh, laid the groundwork and then did uh, bring into effect the Department of Agriculture. They hired European scientists who brought knowledge of soil chemistry and soil ecology into the department. He also believed that we had to get this information to the hands of people who could actually use it, the farmers. The land-grant college act came from that, and I didn't realize till reading this that uh, not just where new colleges started, but existing colleges, including the one I work for up the road, received money from the Land-Grant College Act to develop agriculture programs that would provide knowledge for farmers. And then out of that also came the Homestead Act. So here was a man who arguably was enormously distracted um, between his, his election, his inauguration, seven southern states seceded. Uh, shortly after his inauguration, Fort Sumter was fired upon. War had begun, and yet he persistently worked on this agriculture problem uh, through his administration. And, and the legacy of that, of course, is with us today. So I'd like to think that in terms of the public, uh, the, again, the mayors and the governors, and I recently was asked to join our uh, Mayor Menino's task force as he plans uh, a new um, serious effort to look at uh, how we can improve the, 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 uh, the energy uh, or the reduce the energy footprint of Boston, that we're largely past the, the public acceptance of this problem. Um, I like this uh, particular cartoon. Uh, look, your bumper stickers floated up. I think, I think largely the public is, uh, is on board. Um, there will always be questions about some of the science. There will be people, people who don't like what the science implies. Um, this one is a few years old. Is this the greenhouse effect? Uh, combined with the White House effect, and and we have to, of course, I uh, think, be completely honest here that that I think the um, um, the progress made during uh, the the Clinton Gore administration uh, for many of us was much less than we had hoped, and I think we can be very hopeful that uh, we've turned a corner on that. This one, I think, is a more uh, more accurate description of where our nation has been, um, literally um, hibernating our head in the. Uh, uh, the equivalent of Arctic sand. So um, I will, um, I'll end with um, another photo of polar bears. This was the summer of uh, 2006. Um, 
these uh, majestic icons of the Arctic, and as Arctic ice uh, shrinks, um, so will their habitat. I personally don't think they're in danger of extinction, but, uh, but uh, their area of, of success will shrink dramatically. So thank you very much for your attention, and uh, if we have time, I'll take some questions. Academy of Sciences a few months ago, and what she was saying is if we allow carbon dioxide to reach uh, 600 parts per million, we're at you know, 380 now, 390, that these changes uh, that she's referring to, particularly aridity, um, large areas um, uh, with uh, dust bowl-like conditions would persist for a thousand years. Carbon dioxide composition, um, right? uh, certainly not for millions of years. One thousand year time constant apply to the current level of carbon dioxide. Why would it only apply to a much higher level of carbon dioxide? Well, I think what she's saying is the effects are what would persist for um, a, a, a millennium. That if the concentration goes that high, that these changes would not be easy to reverse. Is what she's saying. You couldn't dial them back. Easily, as, as we have no way of practical way of stripping carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere, and so w w if we want to think about the gravity of of the effects of a, a world warmed by 600 parts per million carbon dioxide, that they will be severe and will be persistent for hundreds of years to a millennia. Well, I just want to end my question. Uh, let me rephrase it. How can she be confident, or are you be confident that we haven't already? Oh, I, I don't, you know, I don't think she is. And again, these are just projections or model scenarios. Um, so, yes, I mean, you know, we, we know people like, I mean, people like Jim Hansen um, and people who are very articulate uh, and have written extensively about this, but not scientists like Bill McKibben, um, you know, believe that um, uh, 350 was, uh, was, was really a, a place we could have remained comfortably indefinitely, and now that we're past 350, we are on uh, borrowed time and argue that we must figure out how to not only arrest these curves, but actually uh, force them downward, um, or not only arrest the increase but in, in CO2 in the atmosphere, but in, in some way draw it back down. And we don't, we don't have practical ways of doing that right now. And it's hard enough to slow them down and to actually strip carbon dioxide, and yet you read Wally Broker's recent book on fixing the climate, you know, he says if you had a, a big filter, kind of the area of the Great Wall of China, and you could, you could, uh, you know, makes the calculations, if you could, you know, absorb CO2 that passed across the filter of that area. So that's, oops, uh, that's something that we don't, if, if Hansen and, and, um, and others are correct, then, then indeed, uh, there would be enormous new incentive to figure out whether strategies like brokers could work. Have you heard this scheme? Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Uh, I was fascinated by Freeman Dyson's piece in the New York Times or his interview uh, a few weeks ago. Lots of different things in it, but prim primarily the, the use of coal to lift China and India out of poverty. That's your relationship to all the mitigation effects. And I just suppose that you're beginning with uh, the, the population change at the start of it and saying that we predicted these certain scenarios. And um, so my question, I think, is were there mitigation effects, uh, mitigation strategies put in place around population? Uh, and were there consequences to that? And why did that population reverse? That's kind of all over. That's a lot. Um, yeah, the Freeman Dyson piece was very interesting. I mean, you, uh, he, he talked about climate models and talked about climate the way 
it was talked about in maybe 1980. You know, he says there's no, no biology, no biogeochemistry in there, no feedbacks. Uh, now, they're not perfect, but it's, it, these, these models are full of, of biogeochemical feedbacks and land processes and, and ocean processes. And, you know, his, his argument that if we move the direction that um, – Many people are saying we should to avoid uh, warming of the earth. Uh, it will lead to more poverty or we will uh, slow the rate at which the developing world is being lifted because they have no alternative to coal. But then he goes on to say, and if we do find, hey, we get to a world we don't like, um, I mean, better than Wally Broker's idea, he's going to genetically engineer trees that will soak up CO2 and pull out the atmosphere. Now, that, that's really science fiction. There's just no – so um, I, I – I, I honestly felt as if he hadn't read anything from the scientific literature for for at least at least twenty, maybe twenty five years. Um, the The population, uh, the, the change in the rate of population has come about in a variety of ways, and and you know there's a well repeated pattern that that has to do with education, and opportunities for women. And and the opportunities for women to make choices. Uh, about their reproductive health, and and that in nations where you have seen resources invested to uh, provide opportunities for women, um, education and employment-wise, uh, the birth rate declines, and you know, birth rate in the United States of America in in the 1800s, <laughs> uh, early 1900s. So you follow you follow these trends, and of course, um, as we have um, uh, been successful in some cases with uh, we, I mean, the human race with childhood diseases and, and increasing um, the probability of survival of, um, of newborns, um, that has also um, helped to diminish the rate of population growth, that, that the sense that their ch children will survive, uh, fewer families are, are, are having fewer children. So there, there books have been written about this, and and you know, it's it's a problem. I'm, I'm barely familiar with it, but that's my understanding of the what's happening on the population side. Yes. There's several good papers have been published about the methane emissions from uh, permafrost in the Dolmens <coughs> uh, in the northern northern latitude. Now we're seeing papers that document the observation of methane emissions from uh, methane clathrates in the Arctic Ocean. How, in your opinion, how much concern do we have uh, about uh, this particular new uh, positive feedback? Yeah, so the question is about the, the release of methane um, from Arctic um, land and, and ocean areas. Um, we, we know that, that methane uh, in the, the uh, ice sort of crystalline clathrate form in, in the seabed is, is, um, is common. The inventories have a huge range of, of uh, uncertainty about them. Um, it, it's, also, it's not clear how much warming uh, would uh, have a or what, what warming, what, how much warming it would take to have a significant effect on release from the seabed uh, clathrates. But you could do it, take any of those numbers in a back envelope calculation, say if it all came out in, in, in a half a century, it would be a catastrophic consequence. The, the bigger concern uh, from what I've seen, I'd say, is on the, uh, the release from, um, from the land system where uh, organic carbon, um, in some cases, actually methane, and, and you see methane forming under the under the ice in the in the tundra and, and in, in in ponds in the under ice in the um, in the Arctic. Um, and and that's it's not a simple uh, phenomenon. I mean, there are uh, uh, microbes that that uh, produce methane as a end product of their metabolism, organic material, and there are microbes that consume methane. So there. Are are methanogens and methanotrophs. And I would say from what I have seen that, um, first of all, it's certainly a concern. But secondly, uh, we don't have enough knowledge from 
uh, careful studies that have been conducted to know uh, how much warming and, and, and drying is important uh, phenomenon here as well, of whether they stay dry, or whether they stay moist or dry, these systems, and to what degree the carbon will be released as methane or as CO2, because the meth if, there, if the methane, if methane is produced but then is consumed, and although with carbon atoms and carbon atoms, you know methane is roughly two dozen times more potent as a radiative forcing agent. So, so that's, a, that's a big research question right now. And I've not seen anything that, uh, that looks like you could make uh, an intelligent uh, projection uh, over any of these warming scenarios for what that number might be. But it, it's certainly on everyone's radar screen as an important question for uh, not research someday, but research now. Maybe it's two. Uh, one is you expressed a lot of optimism, uh, Jim, about the origin of which wasn't entirely clear. <laughs> uh, uh, I believe you have also, in another context, discussed geoengineering, which does not sound like the approach of an optimist. Uh, I'd be curious to know what you think of geoengineering, sulfate emissions, or whatever, uh, as a viable approach. And secondly, a few words on your view on the future of the ocean. Well, I don't have a lot to say about geoengineering. Uh, it, um, it's a catch-all for, um, for many things. Um, some people put uh, manipulation of um, nutrient regimes in the ocean into that bin and others don't. Um, the, the sort of schemes that uh, are mentioned go from something very crude like uh, pretending we're a volcano and throwing a lot of sulfur into the atmosphere. And of course, uh, if you're going to do that, once you start it, you've got to keep doing it. Uh, it's, it's, uh, you saw how, you saw how short-lived the volcanic effect is. It's a few years. Um, I, I must say as I, you know, whether it's in popular science or, or there's not much of this that's in the scholarly journals these days, you see some of these schemes, they sound pretty clever, um, you know, putting little reflectors out in space that have a dark side and a light side, and you could magnetically tune them like a window shade and dial in the perfect uh, climate. Um, so uh, should we be even be looking at that sort of stuff? And I, I think increasingly um, I've heard my colleagues say that, um, going back to your first comment, their pessimism about our ability to, to have the will to do what has to be done to slow the rates of emissions is so overwhelming that they believe that we are going to have to have some alternatives in our pocket that come out of the geoengineering mix. Um, I'm, 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 not a, I'm not an engineer, as you know. Um, I, I don't, uh, I, I, would, I would find abhorrent the notion of, uh, of uh, the, the, the sulfur uh, ejection and, uh, and I'm also um, not at all enthusiastic about some of the suggestions have been mentioned with regard to manipulation of, of ocean chemistry. That having been said, there are other ocean uh, strategies which sound kind of clever, that of, of um, generating clouds with um, big schemes in the ocean that vaporize uh, floating rays that vaporize um, uh, water and, and of course get the clouds at the right level to reflect energy rather than, than um, the clouds can work either way. Um, so I, I'm I'm just babbling. I don't know. Um, one of the biggest threats to the ocean is, um, is not the warming per se, because unlike the surface of, of land, which, uh, you know, it's going to warm, it's going to affect moisture, it's going to affect plants, uh, mixing in the ocean takes uh, this heat to uh, great depths. In fact, that's one of the startling sort of ocean stories over the last couple of uh, decades is having now really good calculations of the, of the inventory of incremental heat that um, is stored in the ocean as a result of this warming over the last 50 years. And I could, you know, it's very, very interesting history on that and how we came to that understanding. Um, ocean currents will, um, will be affected, stratification, uh, and one of the biggest questions for me is what will happen with that 
that Arctic North Atlantic exchange. Uh, the ecosystems in the Arctic um, have evolved to uh, an obligate relationship with ice. If you didn't have summer sea ice in the Arctic, not only would the polar bear have a very hard time making ends, ends meet, um, it's because, or not just, it's because the food web upon which it depends um, requires ice. The seal, the ring seal, which is most of its diet, it, you only find in the ice. Why is it there? Because it consumes the small fish and crustacea which live on the underside of the ice. Why are they there? Because of the algae that live in the ice. And if and all the birds, all the mammals, um, all the fish, all the crustacea in this system uh, have one thing in common, the ice. If you took the ice out, you'd have different plankton, different algae, different crustacea. Um, birds would take a while to figure out what those birds might be. The birds feed at the ice edge. They, the seabirds and, and, you know, hundreds of thousands of seabirds on bird cliffs are by the end of the season when they just about have those chicks ready to fly off the cliff, they're, they're swimming 200 miles to find food. But that's where they go. They go to the edge of the ice. Um, so it would be just a totally different ecosystem. Um, and that means walrus. That means beluga whale. That means narwhal. That means polar bear. And, and down to things you probably don't normally even think about, <laughs> those microscopic <laughs> organisms. But a, uh, one other thing I'll just mention that I think is looming as an even larger concern, and here we can cycle back to geoengineering. Um, the changing of the, of the carbonate chemistry in the ocean by, as a result of the oceans absorbing um, portion of the carbon dioxide they're releasing the atmosphere. And over time, that's, 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 what'll that's what'll result in equilibrium, is the oceans will ultimately uh, pull carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere, equilibrate with the ocean, it's just they can't do it fast enough. But to the degree they're doing it, we're changing the carbonate chemistry. And for uh, a wide array of organisms that, that uh, make shells, hard parts, out of calcium carbonate, either mineral calcite or mineral aragonite, that process becomes more difficult. And the process of maintaining that shell becomes more difficult as the ocean gains more carbon. And it's sort of counterintuitive, but what happens is the pH is shifting downward. Um, and as it shifts downward, the chemistry works against the presence of the, of the um, mineral complex calcium carbonate. It wants to pull it back into solution as calcium and actually as two bicarbonate ions. And so you have key organisms like uh, they're mollusk with uh, aragonite shells. And it turns out aragonite is more sensitive than calcite uh, in the North Pacific, uh, thought to be key in the diet of salmon. Um, and if you see some of these, if you, if you pull them out of the known food webs, uh, you would have to see food webs wired differently. Then, of course, you have coral. And here, you know, it's the, it's the, it's the, the double whammy for the people living on a, an island that's no higher than this, uh, that is coral on a subsiding seamount uh, with sea level rising, uh, with uh, thermal spikes that's bleaching the coral, causing the, the death of, of coral tissue as expelled their zooxanthellae. Nutrition is compromised uh, as seawater becomes uh, more corrosive in terms of calcium carbonate. The substrate they have is, is, is in fact being dissolved at a more rapid rate. So the notion that some small island nations that you might cannibalize low-lying islands to create higher islands, if you've now got uh, not only higher sea level, um, storm surge, um, and, and, and more dissolving power of ocean working against you, it's, it's, a, it's a... So I think acidification, I, I actually don't like that term. It's the one that's used. We're not making the oceans acid. We're just making them less basic. <laughs> that the, the uh, reducing the pH of the ocean, that's harder to say is, I think, going to be as, as big a concern. And if you think, well, we, we can solve the climate problem by, by putting umbrellas in the sky or sulfur in the air, and you continue to acidify the ocean uh, because of the, uh, the uh, increased CO2, that's, that's going to be bad for the oceans. Great. We're going to have a little touch outside. Let's thank Jim once again.